Frequently, when the media talks about childhood obesity, someone inevitably winds up pointing the accusing finger at the food industry. And the food industry definitely has contributed to the problem, especially with some of the products they offer and promote heavily to children. But a few large manufacturers and quick serve restaurant giants have been working for some time to do something about the problem, self-regulating the advertisements they make to children. The Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, CFBAI, was organized within the Council of Better Business Bureaus back in November 2006 by 10 big companies, including Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Kellogg, Kraft, and McDonald's. At the time, these companies boasted that they controlled roughly two-thirds of all kids' food and drink advertising. Then in March 2007, just a few months after forming, the council appointed a new director with a really respected resume, Elaine Kolish, worked 25 years as an attorney with the Federal Trade Commission, where she helped to develop and enforce some of the earliest policy with policies with regard to advertising to children. Now, CFBAI has grown to include 16 big companies, and we are fortunate to have the director here today. Elaine, thanks so much for agreeing to come on the Knife and Fork Show. Thank you, my pleasure. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing at CFBAI. Have I got the acronym right there? Yes, it is a mouthful, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you guys could have had a shorter acronym. Well, sometimes we just say the initiative. The or initiative. people call the Food I Pledge sound, Program. I think I'll, I'll use that instead. Uh, it, it is easier because I know it's a mouthful. So we, we started the program in part to respond to recommendations from the Federal Trade Commission and the Institute of Medicine. Because of the rise in childhood obesity, there was concern about food marketing to kids. So these responsible companies that you noted decided to join with the BBB to do more in the advertising self-regulation arena. Now, BBB already runs a program, a self-regulation program for children called the Children's Advertising Review Unit, or KRU, a much easier acronym, which addresses how all products, including foods, are advertised. This new program was created to address what foods would be advertised to children. And these advertisers pledged to be a part of the solution by advertising healthier or better for you foods to children under 12. That is foods that would meet meaningful nutrition criteria that BBB would have to review and approve. Now you have six really well-known companies involved in this organization, in this effort. Um, what does it take to get into the program if you're, if you're a company interested in participating in this initiative? What you have to do is be willing to make a commitment that you would limit your advertising that's primarily directed to kids under 12, so ads on Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and Disney programs to products that meet meaningful nutrition criteria, or you agree not to engage in child-directed advertising as we define it under our program. So some of our participants, like the Coca-Cola Company and Mars and Hershey, don't advertise to kids. The rest of our 13 participants are using meaningful nutrition standards, and those standards have made a big difference in the types of products that are advertised to kids. Uh, you talked about criteria and standards. Um, how or what, what kind of criteria and standards do you have, and how did you determine those? Well, what we've always said is that the criteria have to be science-based and aligned with scientific thinking or government principles and standards. And we allowed companies initially to have their own standards as long as they were science-based and they met our review and were, we approved them. We have now have a groundbreaking agreement for the companies to use new CFBAI developed uniform nutrition criteria. That will go into effect at the end of December you mean the 2013. Initiatives criteria. The initiatives criteria. Did I say that wrong? <laughs> you said the acronym, and we, we agreed oh. that we were going to use oh, the okay. acronym. <laughs> the so initiatives too, criteria. Too difficult. Right. <laughs> so we have new criteria that we um, developed jointly, and this criteria is going to lead to even more improvements in foods. One of the pieces of feedback that we'd received from a number of people, including the government, was they would like to see company-specific criteria replaced with uniform criteria, and we've done that. So we're gonna have even more improvements in foods. There have already been steady, ongoing improvements. The development of the new criteria hasn't stopped that. That's continuing, but come December 31st, 2013, there'll be new, even tougher criteria in, in effect. So some of these qualifying standards, can you, can you give me some examples of like the criteria that you use, just a few? So what we did in setting our criteria was to look at government definitions or regulations. So what the government defines as healthy. So for an individual product, the sodium level for a healthy product would be 480 milligrams of sodium. And that's the criteria we adopted for individual products like soups. Okay. We set even lower sodium criteria for products like 
cereals and breads where you don't need as much sodium. It's important to remember that um, ingredients like sodium and sugar aren't just flavors. They actually play a functional role in food. So they can, sodium for example, can be an anti-staling agent and, and they can have uh, micro microbiologic properties too, keep products from going bad. Mm. So they, they have an important role and sugar has a role. It can to help keep flakes from turning to mush in your milk right away. So it's not easy to just take sodium and sugars out of products. But our new standards are going to require that sodium go down in products and the sugars go down in a number of products too. Once a company has its products meet these standards, uh, what is it allowed to do with that information? Can it, can it uh, promote that it met these standards in any way? What, 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 what can they do with that? Well, they can advertise those products on child-directed television and print media and on child-directed okay. websites. And they can, of course, say that they're a member of our initiative, and many of them do, and their corporate social responsibility reports are on their websites. But that's about what they, it's basically used as a way, as a metric to determine what products will be advertised to children. Uh, as we were prepping for this discussion, I ask you how many products do you know have met this criteria, and you, that was the wrong way to ask the question, correct? What, what should I be asking? So right now we have about how many products are listed on our product list. So, okay. and here's the distinction. The companies, the 16 companies, have hundreds, probably thousands of products that actually meet the criteria. We're talking about a subset of products that they actually advertise to children. So we actually keep a list of the products that meet the relevant nutrition criteria that they're actually advertising to children or might advertise to children. And that list has about 200 products on it. Okay. Um, do you feel like the group's making a difference? I do. I think there have been steady improvements in the products that are being advertised to children. So some of the products may have the same silly or familiar names, they may have goofy colors, but what's inside the box has changed. So before our initiative, some cereals, for example, might have had 15 or 16 grams of sugar per serving. Now, none have more than 12 grams of sugar per serving, and the vast majority have no more than 10 grams of sugar. That's a big difference from before our initiative. Um, I started off the top of the show by talking about how the food industry kind of gets blamed or vilified for uh, the obesity issue. How do, you, uh, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's fair? I don't think it's fair. I think everyone who is involved in this area knows that obesity is a multifactorial problem. There are so many causes, so many influences from whether you're born by C-section or vaginally, from your cultural um, preferences, from your parents' eating habits, from the foods that are served in schools. And advertising is just a part of the environment in which you know, kids experience. And no one has shown, the Institute of Medicine, which has looked at that, has shown a cause and effect relationship between advertising and obesity. But notwithstanding that, the advertisers in this program wanted to be a part of the solution and support the efforts of parents and schools that are the primary influencers in children's lives. And I give them credit for stepping up and voluntarily doing this. Now, of course, we all know that consumers want healthier products. and having a, a large portfolio of healthy products is good for your bottom line. So there's a happy confluence of factors working here that lead to healthier products for kids. Now, uh, while you've been doing all of this at the initiative, there have been some other uh, efforts and actions taking place on the childhood obesity front and in marketing food to children. Um, there was this hearing, um, uh, well, actually first, there was a, uh, a set of voluntary guidelines that was put forth by an interagency work group. Um, and uh, they went before a hearing, they, they, they got kind of attacked. Um, the IOM has put out a report, 462 page report, uh, where they su suggest that the food industry, within a two year period, if they don't comply with these, you know, these suggestions, that they be forced to comply with them. They, the, the suggestions become mandatory. Um, what is your opinion of all the other things that are going on in this area? Do you think that uh, consumer advocates have overstepped their boundaries here? Do you think they're going, they're going too far? Um, what, what do you think of the, about these other uh, activities? Well, I'm a big fan of the Federal Trade Commission having worked there for 25 years, but I thought that the interagency working group effort went too far, that the proposed nutrition standards that they had were unrealistic and unworkable in so many different ways. At the same time, they asked for, uh, uh, for a comment on those standards. They didn't say, these are the gospel. They said, we recognize that there could be 
technology issues and consumer acceptance issues with these standards and they might need to be changed, voluntary though they were. And so they asked for comment and they asked for alternatives that might be based on definitions of healthy. And that's exactly what we gave them. We gave them a really excellent alternative. And you'll find that the testimony at that hearing you referred to, right. you had um, David Vladek, the director of the, of the FTC, and Dr. Post making very positive comments about the large step forward our companies made in adopting. David Vladek uh, mentioned your organization and yes. paid you a tremendous compliment in, in terms of the direction he thinks that they ought to go more towards. Exactly. And that, you know, earlier in the year, uh, the chairman of the FTC, John Leibowitz, had also said he thought this was a, a great step in the right direction and something they'd hoped would happen. Okay. All right, well, that's all we have time for in this segment. Thanks to Elaine Kolisch for coming down the street to join us. She's just up the street. And thanks to you, our viewers, for watching. Join us again soon for another episode of The Knife and Fork Show.